Hello and welcome to episode 342 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR and we are coming off of a Bryson Hopkins was the key kind of week. Yes, for those of you who played Showdown for the first time in the Super Bowl, you got a good taste of what Showdown is all about. Tyler Higby, of course, was out starting 10 in for the Rams. Kendall Blanton, his backup, was expected to play the Tyler Higby role. Okay, all right. But what if they run a red zone play for Bryson Hopkins, who, you know, is a reasonable pass catcher? Or what if, what if Kendall Blanton gets hurt, which is what happened? You know, he banked up his shoulder. What if it's more of a timeshare than we expected? You know, I'm not saying any of these things were likely, but the more macro point is that in showdown, sometimes, sometimes one catch is enough. And so the point we tried to repeatedly make leading up to the game was that that slate, that Super Bowl slate was priced so tightly that even taking a zero or a one from someone like Hopkins, you know, at $200, well, that could still be the optimal because it allowed you to get Cooper Cup, Stafford, Burrow, T, Odell, Chase, Mixon, whatever. You know, Showdown is a really interesting game. It's massively weighted toward game theory over micro player takes, I think. You know, it's wildly swingy. You know, a lot of times, you know, Kendall Blanton stays healthy and and Hopkins looks like a bad play in hindsight, maybe. But I really do like Showdown when I have time to sit down and think through it. You know, doing the show on Monday nights that we did with our Showdown King, Cody, um, you know, it's it's really deep. You know, even though the format is just for one game, it's really deep. And so there's a lot of different ways to think about it. And again, I think it's really, really interesting. So hopefully some of you guys who were playing Showdown during the Super Bowl for the first time um, got a good taste of it and and had a good experience and and want to play going forward. Because I I do think that, man, it's so interesting. Each slate is, is so unique. And the Hopkins stuff, you know, on certain slates that aren't priced that tightly, Hopkins would have been just an egregious play. But on this particular slate... I do think that it made a lot of sense. Good to see it work out. Anyways, I don't want to spend too much time. The Super Bowl, Evan and I went over that on the show yesterday. The NFL season is officially over. And as always, it's bittersweet. You know, I I think all of us start to feel a bit burnt out by the end of the regular season. But man, you know, give it like a month from now, you know, and I'm just ready to go to war again. And I think Evan feels the same way. It's just, you know, get a little break. And then after a month, it's like, well, what am I going to do now? You know, so in a month, maybe even now, you know, just ready to go to war again. It was really an incredible season, which is crazy because DFS has obviously gotten much tougher. I still personally had my best year ever playing DFS, which is crazy. I, I think our content and projections at ETR were like, so clearly the best it's ever been and the best out there. We had so much fun with the videos and the memes that you guys all saw on Twitter and and elsewhere. So yeah, I'm for sure a little sad that it's over. I do want to give a huge thanks to you, to you all, everyone listening. Like when we're feeling burnt out or, or whatever, people responding to our content or listening or sending a note or replying with a joke you know, it, it just shows that what we're doing connects with people. You know, hopefully you got better at fantasy by following along all year, but but even if not, hopefully you got some entertainment value as well. And, and I know I say it every year, but but just knowing that there are people out there, you know, a lot of people out there who are sick fucks like me, you know, people who really get the joke and, and get what we're trying to do. Um, it means a lot. You know, I, I walk through life and it seems like 95 to 99 out of 100 people aren't really interested in the things that get me going. But then I do this pod or I tweet or I work on something for ETR and, and people respond to it. You know, it kind of it restores my faith in humanity. And, and by faith in humanity, I, I mean more people like me, you know, that that's just the dream, just a whole earth of people, you know, doing sex jokes and grinding their dick off in fantasy football, you know, maybe one day. All right. Don't want to spend too much time on the intro here. Do want to get to your listener questions. 
Enough is enough. Let's get to everyone's favorite portion of the program. Producer Luke, hit the theme music. All right. Thanks to everyone for the questions. Question one comes from Chris Bodero. He says, when are the Gambling Olympics coming back? The people want to know. Yeah, so uh, Chris is referring to something that we did back in the summer of, I guess it was 2017, maybe 2018. I can't remember exactly, but uh, Bales organized most of it. Uh, We talked about it on Three Donkeys a lot. You know, we actually executed on it by some miracle. But the basic idea of the Gambling Olympics was to hold a competition to see the to see who the best gambler is, right? Like it sounds really simple, like a really good idea. But man, it's harder than it seems. Like you need to find games for the Gambling Olympics that are skill games, of course, but not too skillful. Like in other words, we couldn't have say ping pong as part of the Gambling Olympics. Like some people just suck at ping pong and, and they're drawing dead. And then, you know, you run into sample size stuff as well, you know, like DFS and poker are great games for the Gambling Olympics. But if we play one slate of DFS or two slates or three slates of DFS, or we play one poker sit and go, like, does that really prove anything? Is that really the Gambling Olympics? You know, uh, of course not. But also, it's not interesting for the audience to watch, you know, 5,000 hands of poker or, or sit around for weeks playing DFS. So we did a bunch of events. We did uh, rock, paper, scissors, Connect Four, DFS, Poker, Crypto Trading, Lot and Thinks, Yahtzee. Um, there were probably some others that I don't remember. I, I think it went about as well as it could have, actually. You know, it's just tough to produce it for an audience. It's tough to produce it for TV or YouTube or whatever. You know, we had cameramen there. Uh, There's a highlight reel somewhere. But actual coverage of the events was hard because, like, I don't know, they're kind of long and, and boring-ish. Um, Funny part of that was there was a guy there. He was like some big time author or journalist. He had covered a lot of like actually important events before, but he was going to write an article about the Gambling Olympics for the New York Times, the New Yorker or, or something like that. I can't remember. I mean, he was there the whole time. He actually participated. He was there the entire time. It was like three, four or five days. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to write a story about this. And the story just never came out. I- I'm not sure what happened. Either like he decided this was too humiliating uh, to put his name behind in coverage or more likely, you know, the New York Times, the New Yorker, or whoever was like, this is completely absurd. Like we're not putting this in our publication. Um, you know, they probably felt like they had a moral obligation not to give light to this nonsense. But anyways, yeah, the Gambling Olympics was cool. Bales won. I actually think that uh, if executed right for TV as like some kind of reality show where they also cover not just the events, but they cover like the DJ side action, like, you know, we were betting on how fast, you know, head-to-head matchups, how fast people could chug beer and stuff, you know, like, and, and it was high stakes. And, and you know, I think that uh, could work. Um, I think that's an interesting idea. Maybe, maybe we'll try again one day on the Gambling Olympics. We'll see. Question two from Steelers726. He says, I am trying to settle down and join the hashtag Honda Pilot Life. What's your, advo- what's your advice on trying to balance my interests in the hashtag team and team smell the roses while not coming off being too self-centered and hedonistic when meeting new ladies. Thanks. So I actually had a Super Bowl party at, at my house. I don't know. There were maybe 15 dudes or so and all but two came with their wife and kids, of course. I mean, my wife and kids were there, you know. So it's just like a total anarchy of kids, probably, you know, 30 of them running around like maniacs during the Super Bowl. And, and these two, two single guys, like I said, there were only two single guys there. They turned to me and they're like, you know, my God, is this really the goal? Uh, I mean, is this it? Uh, you know, I mean, we're in the burbs. You know, there's kids crying in every corner of the house. So, yeah, to hear Steeler 726 here say his goal is to join the Honda Pilot life, like, I think we got to aim a little higher, personally. Uh, to address the question, though, basically, I think what he's saying is that he's interested in the intercourse. He's interested in being on team to smell the roses as he should be but he also wants to settle down and, and live the life that society expects of him well I, I got bad news buddy you know you can't have both but if you really do want to be on team honda pilot then i think just honesty and being genuine goes 
really far, like, especially with women. I mean, in all aspects of life though, like, so, so why not just say like, I've had a crazy life, but now I, I really want to go to Little League games on Saturdays and mow the lawn, you know, and talk to my friends about the latest bond yields and go around telling everyone how tired I am and, and go to Applebee's for dinner. You know, that, that's what I'm really missing in life. So, so yeah, you know, women will eat that up. That, that, that's gold stealers. Question three from Miguel says, have you considered starting a solo podcast just talking about life? You're a pretty funny dude with a good bit. The path is there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Miguel. I, I appreciate it, man. So I've been doing some version of the solo pod since 2015. Crazy. I've never done the solo pod in the off season before. Partly, I think, because I, I need a break. Um, you know, I mean, these sex jokes don't write themselves. It, it takes a ton of time to get ready for the solo pod. But, but I think partly because if there's no football slash DFS slash gambling to talk about, I'm not really sure there's enough for a full podcast. Like part of the big joke here, like part of the whole bit is that we talk very seriously, you know, very hardcore, very analytical about fantasy football. But then, you know, we also do these absurd jokes. So I'm just not sure a pod of all jokes and no football really works. But Maybe it does, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it does, and, and I'm willing to try it. You know, if you want the solo pod to continue all year round, um, let me know. I, I really do enjoy doing it. It's clearly the most fun thing that I do. So so let me know, you know, I, I don't know, Twitter or, or comment section in iTunes, and, and I'll see it. Um, we'll see how it goes. You know, if, if there's enough to talk about every week, then then yeah, I'd like to continue to do the solo pod every week and and answer life's great mysteries. Question four from Benny. He says, when going to a restaurant, how in-depth does your mind get about using the same silverware as someone else? Do we or should we fully trust the restaurant's dishwashers? Yeah, Benny, it's it's truly insane, man. Uh, again, I stopped doing the germ jokes because they're not funny anymore because of the pandemic. Like People have actually gone insane on germs. It, it's not a joke. But back when I was doing these kind of germ avoidance jokes, these filth jokes. I mean, the idea that some shitty restaurant dishwasher or some dude, you know, lightly brushing a glass with a disgusting rag and old water. I mean, to suggest that that stuff is now clean is obviously burying your head in the sand. Uh, long before this pandemic, you know, long before everyone was insane, uh, uh, way before it, I only drank from bottles or cans when I'm out. And, you know, when you're out, you have to use the silverware. Like, you can't be a total mutant and bring your own silverware to a restaurant. But, yeah, you know, just know that every time you go to a restaurant, you're essentially making sweet love to someone else through that soup spoon. And, and it's not some beautiful woman, you know. It's some fat slob who used the soup spoon before you, you know. So, yeah, I think you just got to bury your head in the sand. I mean, it just it, it is what it is. I'm willing to except that for the joy that is going out to eat, which I, I really do love. Question five from One Shot. He says, would you be willing to accept a free throws bet? Five chances to go 50 out of 53 from the free throw line. I'm sure some of you remember the Timex, uh, Mike McDonald, you know, a uh, friend of the show, Mike McDonald, the, the, the free throw bet that he did. Basically, he has like, he posted a video of himself with like the worst form I've ever seen shooting a basketball. And, you know, just for fun, he wasn't like trying to get action. He wasn't trying to sandbag. Like, you know, he was just posting it or maybe a Jones posted. I don't remember, but he posted this video and everyone was making fun of him. And he was like, fine, you know, give me a year and I'll make 90 out of hundred free throws. And he did it easily, easily, of course, because shooting isn't really an athletic thing. It's not like somebody said, Oh, you know, go, go score 10 points in a college basketball game. Like, that's not what they said. They said, I'll make 90 out of 100 free throws. And again, it's not really an athletic thing. I mean, it, it is an athletic thing, but it's a repeatable motion with static conditions. You know, like you can train yourself to shoot free throws without being good at basketball. You know, same thing as like bowling or, or hitting a golf ball in the range. You know, it's just repeated motion over and over again, the same thing in the same conditions. Now, the difference between what one shot is proposing to me here and what Timex did 
is the number of chances and the pressure that comes with that. You know, Timex had unlimited opportunities. He could go out there, you know, 20 hours a day for a month and just try to make 90 out of 100. What one shot is suggesting, five chances to make 50 out of 53, and you only get five chances, you know, that's a lot of pressure, man. And pressure undoubtedly affects performance. You know, if you haven't been under pressure while trying to do something athletic or, or really anything before, it's tough to describe. You know, like senior year of high school, we played so many close games and, and you know, we played in big games at the end of the year and, and I would go to the free throw line at the end of the game. You know, a lot of people in the stands, you know, my arms and legs like are like, feel like jelly. Like, yeah. And maybe everyone doesn't feel that. I don't know, but I definitely do. So anyway, I, obviously if I did this bet, I would hire a shooting coach because my shot is so broken now and I'm generally just so, so, so bad. I, I think Timex actually hired the Orlando Magic shooting coach or something ridiculous like that. But I, I still don't think I would take this bet. Um, sadly, one shot. It's just a lot of pressure and, and stress. I don't think I'm really up for right now. And and again, I, you know, I just suck. Like our rec league basketball team is two and four. Uh, we got a win last night, but I think only because the other team only had four guys show up and we played five on four the whole game. But anyways, you know, we're two and four and and I take uh, full responsibility. You know, I'm just not good enough. Question six is from friend of the show, Adam Roush. Adam did a great job with the GPP game scores for us this year. It was an awesome addition. He says, is holding the door open for others an overrated practice nowadays? What is the appropriate cutoff distance for holding the door for someone behind you? And yeah, they did a Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm about this. It was so, so good. Uh, speaking of Curb Your Enthusiasm, I don't know if you guys saw the Larry David uh, FTX Super Bowl commercial. I mean, he crushed it. It was so good. I, I can't believe Larry David and FTX are working together. It's just worlds colliding. It's amazing. But anyways, I, I am very pro holding the door, like really pro. And a, a lot of it is I just like really do hate myself. Like I am not a good person when it comes to being unselfish and caring about other people. But but one thing I can do, like I definitely can take an extra five seconds or an extra 10 seconds and, and just stand there and hold the door. You know, I get that smile, get that thank you. You know, it's a no-brainer. It's so easy. Like other things in theory are easy. You know, every year I say, oh man, this year I'm going to go buy 100 turkeys and I'm give them out to people on Thanksgiving. You know, people in need on Thanksgiving. I'm just going to go give them turkeys. Or, or I want to gather up all these toys that my kids don't play with and, and I'm going to donate them. And yeah, like I, I genuinely do want to do that stuff, but I just like get too busy or too frazzled or it's not a priority or, or I don't know how to execute it. And, and so I end up not doing it, but holding the door, like, yes, I can give the 10 seconds extra to get that feeling that I'm a good person, you know, even though deep down, I know it's a lie. All right, question seven, last question we're going to do today comes from CC. He says, Adam, is it acceptable to J.O. jerk off privately when both you and your spouse are working from home? Great question, CC. Uh, great question. These are the important topics of the pandemic that the mainstream media refuses to cover. Um, luckily, I'm here to fill in the gaps. And the answer, CC, of course, is yes. Yes, it is acceptable. I mean, who among us uh, hasn't yerked while our spouse is sleeping next to us, you know, let alone in a whole other room. You know, we're not gods, you know, we're mere men. A more interesting question, though, I think, is if CC's play here is GTO, right? Like, if you are home working and your spouse is home working, I, I mean, why are we not just going for the intercourse? You know, some afternoon delight of sorts. I, I personally think, CC, that she would find that riveting, you know? Change it up. Keep it fresh. You're welcome, CC. All right. That is going to do it for this edition of the Solo Pod. We'll be back next week to review some of our biggest misses and biggest hits from the 2021 season. See if we can gather some takeaways to help us get better in the future. So be sure you're subscribed to this podcast. It's free for that. And we have a big, big plan of free podcasts and content the rest of the way. So again, please be sure you're subscribed. 
If you have not checked out our NBA product yet, DFS and props are both up on the site right now. Props team continues to just absolutely slay it on just an incredible amount of volume as well. Same process as NFL. Be sure to check that out. For Bruce and Luke, for Jerry, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.